Sweet. Okay. Everyone who knows me online is not going to be surprised at all about that. So, okay, I'm Susanna. Um, hi. 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 All right. <laughs> Got the basic protocol. Uh, so, I am a PhD student. Does anyone have an idea of what a PhD student does? What do you think my day-to-day -day looks like? Yeah? You work on your um, thesis? Mm -hmm. I work on my thesis. Exactly. Uh, so I'm a microbiologist. What do you think of me doing most of the time? Studying. Studying, yeah. I do a lot of reading. I've taken a lot of classes. Um, what do you think of as a scientist? What do you think scientists do all day? Hmm? Experiments. Experiments, right? I'm doing a bunch of experiments. I'm sitting at the bench. I'm reading. And what's really exciting too is that scientists get to do a lot of presentations. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the perks of my job. But I also want to tell you that, so I'm in, I just started my fifth year of my PhD. And uh, on average, it takes people about five and a half to six years to get a PhD in the biological sciences, so all the life sciences. Um, so that translates to the fact that I am in the 21st grade. <laughs> so let me see, I want to know what the age distribution is here. So um, raise your hand if you are over 13. Okay. Keep them up if you're over 14. Over 15? Over 16? Over 17? How old are y'all? 18. 18. <laughs> like, 35? <laughs> All right, so that's pretty awesome. Um, and I wanted to start out because I was thinking back about being in middle school and high school, and it was really awkward, actually. Um, I think seventh grade was my least favorite year, and it, then it got better, for sure. But uh, yeah, it was hard, and it just keeps getting better, though, because I don't know about y'all, but I was one of the nerdiest people in my does anyone else feel like that sometimes? Yeah, yeah, occasionally. Um, but what's great is you, high school you get a little bit of this, but college you go and you start focusing on the things that you really love to do, and you're surrounded by people who also love to do it. But first of all, this is a flashback to me at 15 years old. Um, it's an interesting choice. There's no pictures of me at 14. I somehow, I avoided cameras for an entire year, I don't know how, but it was because I also had a perm and bangs and like a unibrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I wanted to give you an idea of who I was then, but also who I am now. And, uh, you know, when we talk about scientists, a lot of times we just focus on the stuff we do for work, uh, or seem kind of stuffy or something like that, but I'm pretty similar to most 20-somethings where my favorite things to do are spend time with my dogs. I have two dogs. This is Athena and this is Hermes. Uh, I love to cook. I love hanging out with friends. Um, I also like to read a lot, but there's not a really interesting picture of that. I could show you the book. And I love to travel. And like I was saying, one of the best parts of being a student or a scientist is that you get these opportunities to travel and talk about your science with other people all around the world who love science. So um, two years ago, I got paid to go talk in Spain. And this summer, does anyone know physics girl? Uh, on YouTube? A little bit. Yeah, so I get to meet her this summer because we're talking at the same place uh, in Portland, Oregon. So, you know, if, if you're thinking of scientists, we do a bunch of other stuff. But who, like, who is a scientist? When you think of, like, what does a scientist do in general? Who counts? Yeah. Ask questions. Ask questions. Scientific method. <laughs> Scientific method. I like it. So, yeah, go ahead. Solves questions. Exactly. So, looks for answers, right? Scientific method, you're going to find questions. You're going to think about, like, what's important? What do I like? I'm showing you a picture of my desk at work. So, like was said earlier, 
Feel free, come on in. Uh, like what was said earlier, that a large majority of my time is actually spent reading, um, and mostly on the internet, I'm constantly Googling at my desk. And then I make hypotheses, right? Anyone have a basic definition of a hypothesis for me? Mm -hmm. A question you want to answer through uh, performing experiments. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And is this just a question that I have off, off the top of my head? Where do I get these questions? Is this, yeah? You get them when you see holes in the research. Yep, so you, the answer was you get them when you see holes in the research that's already been done, which is exactly right. It's, or, or it can also be things that you kind of think about and you realize, I don't have an answer for that. And it seems like there's, exactly, there's a space between what is known here and here, but there's not really a middle part. So we're looking for answers. And then I think another thing that's really important is to share with others. So I like to do that in talking, um, going and visiting other scientists, but I'm also required to publish some papers. And that's a really big way how scientists talk to each other. So today I'm going to be talking about microbiology mostly, talk a little bit about plants, but you can always feel free, just raise your hand, uh, ask questions at any time. We're going to do a little presentation, talk about things. We might do a little activity depending on your interest. And uh, but yeah, I'm a really open book and you can feel free to ask me whatever as we go along. So what are microbes? Someone who I haven't heard from yet. It's small living creatures. Small living creatures. Yep. They're tiny organisms. Tiny organisms, right? Organism means like alive, it's biology. Um, so this includes things like bacteria, um, some fungi, protists, which are, and animals too. They're super tiny animals that fit under microbiology, viruses. And what I'm showing you up here is actually a picture of the bacteria that I work on. So I work on a bacteria called Bacillus subtilis, and it lives in the soil. And we'll talk more about why that's important. But um, I always see these pictures, and it has a little scale bar that says five micrometers, which is super tiny, right? And I always see these scales of, okay, it's, it's this proportion of a basketball, or it's whatever. But I found this, and I thought it was really cool. So I want you to think about the thickness of your hair. Like, think about how big it is in diameter, right? So these are bacteria on a piece of hair, right? That's how tiny they are. So all the stuff we're doing, and this gives you an idea of where bacteria are. We'll talk about that. Um, so they're super tiny. Where are they? Everywhere. Yep. In your hair. They're on your hair, obviously, right? <laughs> they're on your hair. Um, maybe a better question is where aren't they? Space. Space. Out of that attitude. I like it. Oh man, we're going to get into space microbiology, which is a real thing. You can actually study microbes in space. You take them up into this uh, space station and you can study them. And there's. Or you can let them loose on the moon and worry about the consequences later. There we go. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're already. We got no problems down here. We'll just you know, let the food do its thing. Um, yeah. So. What's interesting, we haven't found them coming from outer space, and that's true. We have shown that they can live on the outside of uh, satellites. They can go all the way up there with the satellites. But yeah, that's pretty much the only place we haven't really found them. We find them all over your body. We find them super deep in the ocean. You can drill down hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles down into the earth and still find microbes. So they're everywhere. What about in the core of the Earth? We don't know yet. That's a big question. So we really think not likely, right? Because of the temperature, the pressure. But every time we say it's not likely, we're usually wrong, right? So maybe one of you will figure out that, that answer. And I, I don't know, who here thinks that there is life in outer space? Well, yeah. I'm still undecided. Like, I finally, someone, I used to think, no, not at all. But I finally changed my mind a little bit that maybe it's possible because someone showed me the map. Yeah. Yes. I don't know anything about math, but they explained to me, and for a half a second, I understood it. 
but nice work. All right, so they are everywhere. Um, and what do microbes do? That's fine, you can take a selfie. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> All right, so it depends on microbes. So what do microbes do? If you think about microbes, what's the first thing they come to mind? Whatever they want. Whatever they want. I hope. <laughs> that is the best answer I've ever heard. Microbes do whatever they want. They absolutely do. Okay, so what do we care about microbes doing? Making medicine. You got an idea? They affect the environment. Yeah. How they affect us in other words. How they affect us. Awesome. So, yeah. They can make antibiotics. They can make a bunch of our drugs, but they also are the reason that we get sick sometimes. A lot of times. Almost every time. Um, but they can do other cool things. They can make, they can help make yogurt. They make a bunch of cheese. Um, yeast are absolutely essential for making bread. Does anyone know what yeast do to make bread? You all know what yeast do? Yes. They eat sugar. They eat sugar. And then what do they do? Create carbon dioxide. They release carbon dioxide. Exactly. They make bubbles. And then, and if you ever try this, if you ever try to make bread without yeast, it's horrible. It just doesn't work. It's matzo. Um, matzo. 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 What? So that's a great point. Um, so this is going to be, actually I'll tell you first. So this is the root. I'm using the super high powered microscope and it's called a confocal microscope. Um, how do you, this is a hard question. Um, so does anyone know what the constraints of microscopes are? Like why can't we see infinitely tiny? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
microscope that you use as a light microscope, mm -hmm. which uses the light waves to see things. Mm -hmm. But some of the light waves in the visible light spectrum are bigger than the things we want to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, or visible light, yeah. Um, as you get smaller and smaller, you need brighter and brighter light to shine out and still get the same. Exactly. So if you can think about that hair and those bacteria, light is just the wavelengths of light that we can see, they're too big. And it's sort of like if I was trying to find out exactly where this pole was and I was throwing those giant beach balls that you see at like parties, I might throw them and eventually kind of figure out, okay, it's somewhere over here. But if I was throwing ping pong balls, I could figure out pretty much exactly where this is. So I use what's called a confocal microscope. It uses lasers at all these different, very precise wavelengths. And it can figure out exactly where different things are. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you here is that this is a root. Um, this is, you can see, this is a little root hair. This is a root cell, they're super long. They're not exactly rectangular. I don't know why they always put that in textbooks. Um, but these things on the side, you can see them, these are little rods, and these are actually my bacteria. And so what I'm gonna show you is that it's a video, and what I'm doing in this video, it's not actually moving, it's at one time, but I'm taking the microscope and focusing it up through the plant. So you're gonna see how the plant looks in more of like a three-dimensional view. So, oh, worked. Okay, so we're just moving up out of the root. And what you can see is that these bacteria actually sit in these huge clumps on this root. Um, and this is really cool. And what I didn't tell you is that this is actually four different types of bacteria. So they can live together. Um, hmm. How many types of bacteria do you think live on these plants? Any guesses? Hundred. A hundred? I like that guess. Any other guesses? Thousands? Million? Million? Yeah. Who said that one? <laughs> yes. Okay. So that is, all of you are right. Actually, if you look at scientific papers, you will find pretty much all of those answers. You will find people who say, this plant only has five bacteria that like it. You'll have people who say that this plant has thousands. And you have people who say, well, if you pull it out of the ground, you get this many, but if you pull out all of its neighbors combined, you get hundreds of thousands or even millions. So should we say that one plant can hold a million or should we say that one single plant can only hold thousands? I don't know, but it's definitely more than four. So my work is to try to figure out how are these interacting and how are they in these groups still getting to the plant and doing what they need to do. So let's think of the soil, right? I just told you that plants are covered with hundreds or thousands of different types of bacteria, um, and they're coming from the soil, right? Ooh, I have another one. How many bacteria do you think exist in one teaspoon of soil, or like one gram? Yeah? Wait, hold on. <laughs> 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 I realized my answer wasn't actually an adequate answer. No, it, it, inadequate answers are the best answers. Um, you can say more than four. I'll say like definitely more than four. Definitely more than four. I'd say three. Millions? Millions? Four million? Four million? Four million? Four million? Four million? Millions millions is, is Wait, pretty close. Billions. Billions. Okay. Billions is a lot closer. So one teaspoon of soil can hold a billion or ten billion microbes. That's a lot. Um, so we have all of these different microbes living in super close space. We have plants living here. And some of these bacteria want to get to the plants. Um, but we have to remember that they're all interacting with each other. They're sending signals. Do you know how they, they send signals? How do they interact with each other? It's not a bad idea. Unfortunately, they don't have neurons. But close. Does anyone know what neurotransmitters are if you break them down further? Yeah. True. Um, do you know how they send electrical pulses? This is weird, and it's like forcing me to rethink of biology. Yeah. Chemical reactions. Oh, that was great. Okay. So it's happening the same way, but instead of like um, calcium charges and those sort of influx, outflux pumps, what's happening here is that these different bacteria in the plants are producing chemicals. And the bacteria can sense the plants, the bacteria can sense each other, the plant can sense the bacteria. They're all kind of 
if you think about it, standing wherever they are, or you know, whatever bacteria do stand. But and they're screaming out into the void by sending out these signals that says, hello, I'm here, where is food? And it's trying to listen for a plant that says, hello, I'm here, where is helpful bacteria? And then they, they meet up. So um, these sort of interactions, what can happen is that you lose some bacteria um, and some go to the plant roots and you get some growing more and more. So my actual science is looking at how they're interacting. So that's, we just went from talking about like what are microbes to what exactly is my thesis project. My exact thesis project is figuring out how bacteria interacting affect which ones get onto the plant root. Now this is the last like hardcore data slide I think I'll show you and then be more chatty. So if we, if I use that confocal microscope again, right, I have my microscope, I have my plant, and I've colonized it with bacteria. So I've allowed these bacteria to stick to it. If I look at this plant, um, this is at the top. So if this is a plant, to be in, like the leaves would be up here and would go all the way down, and that's the root tip. So here I have the root crown and all these little root hairs. If you ever get a chance, put a tiny plant under a microscope, it's so much fun. So you have this here, you have the middle section. This is just what a plant looks like under a microscope. It's way cooler in person. Yeah. If you put the back side of the silverberry leaf under a microscope, yeah. it's really cool. Oh, yeah. You know what's funny is I have so many toys I could play with in my lab. So if you work as a scientist, you get access to all other labs. Um, so I work as a microbiologist. I have no use uh, for liquid nitrogen, and I totally play with it. <laughs> so that's on a video now. That's questionable. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what level of magnification did you have to use for not not these pictures, but the picture we've had before with the um, yeah? Or could see the yeah, what was that? At least a, like a thousand. X. Yeah, at least a, I, I think yeah, I, I think it's about I believe that was six hundred times magnification. Yeah. yeah, that should be right. That's a great question, though. Um, so. But if I've added bacteria to this plant, um, what I can see is that here's, here's the same thing, but there's a bunch of junk on it, right? Uh, but this isn't really that cool looking. I mean, relatively. I could say this one looks cleaner, but what some things I want to do is I want to be able to actually see individual bacteria and I want to understand where they are on the plant. And so the bacteria I use, I mentioned it earlier, it's called Bacillus solis. And we are able to, in the lab, add in new genes. And so we added in the gene that makes the fluorescent protein. Does anyone know what fluorescence means? Uh, glowing. Glowing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the trick with fluorescence, and this is why we use a laser. The cool thing about fluorescence is if you shine one wavelength off of it, it glows. But the trick is it glows in a different wavelength. So you can shoot it with one wavelength and then it bounces off and your computer can tell you where it is. So it's glowing and so what we can do is that if all of our bacteria, yeah, so you can shoot the whole, so you can use your fancy laser microscope to laser the entire root and then your computer can be like, hey, these spots have a different wavelength on them. They, they must, when they got lasered, they must have, been bacteria exactly. as well. Exactly. And so that's what you see here, is that this is where the bacteria are. So all of my bacteria have, they express what is called the cyanofluorescent protein. They're making blue. Uh, and so we can, we can shoot my fancy laser at it, and we can see exactly where all these bacteria are. And that's a lot easier than zooming in on that picture and trying to count them or something. Um, and then what's also really cool, and we can talk about this more later if you have questions, but uh, or now, but one other thing is I can look at what kind of behaviors are happening really directly. So, how should I ask this? How do bacteria change their behaviors? How does, how does anything change its body? Yeah. Well, bacteria, it's um, the outside that can affect it. So different things can come in from the outside. Yes, yes, I remember genes. So, genes, DNA, yeah. 
Are we talking about plasmids and how bacteria can exchange plasmids with each other? So that's how we get these glowing proteins into the, into the bacteria, and that's totally true. And then so bacteria have little chunks of DNA that are little circles, usually of plasmids, and then they have bigger genomes, which is all of the DNA in them. And so what the bacteria do, though, is when they want to change their behavior, let's say they're living on a plant and the plant dies, and they want to go to a new living plant because they don't want to be there anymore, um, they have to decide, OK, I was just sitting here stuck to this plant, and I need to start swimming away. It'll turn on different genes, and it will make different things. So it used to be stuff. Now it's going to make a little flagella and swim away. It's real. Isn't that crazy? Uh, so in this case, I have, I have a fluorescent uh, protein. I have a different color fluorescent protein that will turn on whenever my bacteria is trying to stick to a plant. So I can figure out, these are where all of my bacteria are. But in yellow, I can see where the pockets are of the bacteria that are trying to actively stick to the plant and make all the things that are going to help their neighbors stay on the plant. And I can look at them all together and say, oh, this is interesting. Up here, a lot of them are really trying to stick to the plant versus you know, the outermost parts, maybe not so much, and maybe they have to be close. So that is what most of my research is doing. But why am I doing this? Why do we study plants? Yeah. Why not? Why not? I love that. Um, this is exactly why I'm studying microbiology. I love microbiology just because I love it. Uh, in AP Bio in junior year of high school, we had, I think, two and a half days on microbiology, and I learned about viruses and bacteria, and I was like, that is the coolest stuff I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty exciting. So I, and I found out in college that I could just do that for a job. But, okay. So I love studying bacteria and plants, just because, but how do I get the government to pay me to study this stuff? Or at least pay you what it's about your health. Yeah, exactly. Any idea? Um, because it's really important to the, the environment and also bacteria can make people sick, and that is interesting too. Exactly, yeah. We eat plants. We eat plants. Any others? Grant application. Grant application. <laughs> also, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for fertilizer. So that's, that actually ties 
directly back in. So we're getting, we're wasting food, we're wasting fish, but like one of the ways we're wasting fish is that we're using it to make plants grow, right? So we have to grind it up, probably because of the nitrogen and the phosphorus, um, and put that back in the soil because we're trying to grow plants and it just doesn't make sense. So we need to figure out better ways to grow plants. And so I'm gonna show you a really quick video. I like this video. Um, one, I'm biased because I helped write it. But the other is that the Moorhead Planetarium actually got together and helped do this. So I'm, we're, we'll show it now. It's like three minutes. And it's meant for sixth graders, but smart sixth graders. Uh, and I wanted to tell you also that if you go onto YouTube, it's a 360 video, which means you can drag it around and see like all around. Or if you have like an Oculus Rift or any sort of 3D. Or some yeah. cardboard. Or some cardboard, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You can also, there's, there's some, yeah, with your, is that with your smartphone that you can do that? Google Actually, never cardboard. Like what? Google Cardboard. Google Cardboard. Okay. It's, it's a VR headset made of cardboard that you can slide your phone into. You can't actually interact with anything, but you can look around. You can interact. You can interact. Yeah, you can interact. There's one button. Look, there's one button. Yeah. You can interact. Okay. So. Alright. Alright. But seriously, if you get a chance, if you have the Google Cardboard, I almost just fell over. Um, if you have the Google Cardboard or the Oculus Rift or anything, um, it's fun on your computer, but I freaked out when I got to see this in the virtual reality because I was like, this is my research, and I was getting to look at it as if I were a micro. So anyway, science is fun. Okay, here's the show. About two million more people will live on planet Earth from here today. That's more than two hundred times the population of New York City. And all of these people will be deep. Farmers around the world grow tons of food, mainly plants like corn, soybeans, and lice. But with our planet's limited range of water resources, farmers may not be able to meet our needs. Scientists are researching ways to grow more food without using more land or more water, or more chemicals that could harm the environment. Important new research focuses on the soil in which plants grow. Soil is full of microscopic life, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, and bacteria. Some of these organisms can be dangerous to plants, and some, such as mycorrhizal fungi or pseudomonas bacteria, can be beneficial. Up to a billion bacteria can be found living in just one teaspoon of soil, but all bacteria are not the same. Scientists are learning that different bacterial species can play different roles in the successes or failure of a farmer's crop. A plant is rooted in the soil. It cannot hunt for food elsewhere or move out of harm's way. What a plant can do is release hormones and other chemicals. I feel like that's dramatic. The kinds of soil bacteria sense these signals and travel to the plant's root. Once there, they may live on the root surface, or they may venture and live inside the root. Some of these bacteria feed the plant by collecting and digesting mineral nutrients from the soil. Other bacteria defend the plant from disease-causing organisms and viruses. Bacteria have even been found to protect the plant from drought by coating the root with a sticky goo called biofilm. Scientists are studying how these bacteria can be used strategically to produce healthier crops. For example, rice plants in one field are infected by a fungus common to the region, while a nearby field has a strong, healthy crop of rice. Scientists may be able to identify the bacteria that make rice plants resistant to the fungus, and then develop a method for adding the beneficial bacteria to fields where the soil lacks them. Hopefully, advances like this will help us use our planet's limited resources to produce enough food to meet our increasing needs in the coming years. I'm at the very bottom. Wait for it. Wait for it. Aha! Me. It's me.
Yeah, so that's my technical title. Okay. So, all right. What are, do you have any questions following that video? Was there anything that you made you think about? No. How do you feel about this idea? Do you think we can actually take the good bacteria and put them into the bad bacteria soils? I mean, I just showed you they have to all interact with each other. Do we need to them to be able to outnumber the bacteria which they compete with yeah. without overdoing it? You don't want them to the so all to be saturated with any type of bacteria, even if it's beneficial to the plant, because then those bacteria would compete, be competing with each other, and that can produce results like they could evolve to compete against other other beneficial bacteria. Beneficial bacteria could evolve to compete against other beneficial bacteria and just be worse beneficial bacteria overall. Exactly. There's gonna be a bunch of competition, right? Yeah. So you told us quite a bit about how the bacteria help. So the question was. <laughs> Good question. Um, so the question was, okay, great. The bacteria get a, a place to live, but what else do they get? The plant is being protected. The plant gets everything. You know, what is what do the what do the bacteria get? So um, how do plants get food? Roots and bacteria. Sunlight. Uh, sunlight. Sunlight. Yeah. Yep. Sunlight. Air. So. What's so, cool? So they need minerals. So they need minerals to build themselves and sugars, which they can produce, like for chemical energy to run uh, to power everything. Exactly. Yeah. Because carbon dioxide and water contain all the atoms you need to make sugar. That's true. Right. And so they get carbon dioxide from the air, and they get water from their roots. Yes. Exactly. They're able to make sugar. So, and actually, y'all said something that I didn't know before I got to grad school. I didn't know anything about plants. I don't like plants. I'm sorry. They're really good. They're good for us. I love eating. But I'm just, I'm not as excited about them. And that's fine. There's a ton of scientists that love plants. Uh, and I think that's actually a really important takeaway is that you don't have to love all of science to love part of it. So if you're ever like, I love science, I love astronomy. And someone else is like, yeah, but do you like geology? No, I don't like geology. Like, well, you're not a real scientist. Not true. Every scientist I know has at least one field of science that they never want to hear about. But, so plants, the thing I didn't know is that, yeah, plants have to make their own sugars, right? They have to make their own energy. But they also have to take up nutrients from the soil. So the bacteria can help release those nutrients from the soil. And what they get back is those sugars. So a plant, even though it's working so hard to, to make all these sugars, might release about a fourth of the sugar back into the soil. So it's making a, stuff, a bunch of stuff in the leaves and it's producing it out of the soil. And so that's what the bacteria get, is they just get like unlimited food. Can humans harvest these sugars? Huh? Can humans make like, uh, harvest these sugars if they're able to make a more efficient way of supplying the needs of the plants? Maybe. I mean, that's kind of a problem in hydroponic systems where the plants are floating around and they're just secreting stuff and you get fungus all the time. So you think maybe we could at least do something with those sugars. Yeah? Wait, so isn't this like the reason why there's like crop rotation? Because like I know potatoes release a lot of nitrogen into the soil. Mm -hmm. um, well, like some other plants and some plants don't put nitrogen into the soil. Exactly. So the question was, is this why we do crop rotation? Because of minerals. And that's exactly right. So one of the biggest limiting factors is nitrogen, which is why we grind up uh, fish and put it in the soil, um, which is just kind of gross. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so but that's exactly why we do crop rotation. And it's also one of the things that scientists are realizing is we grow the same exact plant in the field over and over again. Not only are we using all the minerals that that plant wants, but we're also just keeping a small subset of the bacteria. And so if you need some other bacteria to help a different plant grow, then when you, you might just run out. It might become the system where you only have like one kind of bacteria. Right. Exactly, cotton fields that have been just 
constantly repopulated for hundreds of years, I guess, at this point. Yeah, they're running out. Uh huh. When people grow bananas, like every few years, what they have to do is they cut all down all the bananas and start growing pineapples. Mm -hmm. and then oh. after they grow pineapples, they might grow bananas again. Does anyone know what's happening to bananas right now? Yeah. Death by fungus. Death by fungus. Yeah. So um, that this is the last kind of bananas we were maybe really exported. Mm -hmm. Like the big whatever bananas. And now we have a yeah. name I don't know bananas, and we might have to switch to other name I don't know bananas. Exactly. So they're monocrops. They're monocrops, but not only are they that, um, bananas don't actually grow from seeds. So pretty, and we keep trying to use uh, the fungicides, so the stuff that kill fungus, on these bananas and we keep not doing it. And so because bananas don't grow from seeds, they're actually all genetic clones of each other. Wait, oh right, we bred bananas to not have seeds. <laughs> That's the issue. That's why they're all monocrops, because it's hard to make not monocrops. Yeah. Uh-huh. When my mom bought a fresh banana, she was eating it, and she got a really yucky seed. Oh, whoa. She, someone's doing experiments somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Right. So the question was, you know, this is a nice idea, but what are you going to do? Like spray gallons of bacteria into your soil? Um, kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We we pour fish on there anyway. Bacteria are no big deal. And manure. Uh, and manure. Yeah. So there's That's basically the same effect. It's some of the same effect, exactly. But what we want to be able to do, right, is figure out exactly which bacteria are helpful. And then figure out, like we were saying, we're going to have to worry about competition. So what my job is right now is figuring out which bacteria play nicely together and which of them compete and keep all of each other off of the root. Um, and the way that we usually do this to see if there's an effect is we either put it in the water that we're watering the plants with, or sometimes we'll actually grow a little seedling uh, in some soil and transplant it. Have any of you ever started uh, seeds inside at the start of spring and then move them outside to become big plants? Yeah? No. Not yet. <laughs> um, so in that first step, you can add in bacteria, and we want them to stay with the plant and move out. And that's something that could be done at a larger scale. Um, it doesn't always work. But uh, when I heard this, I, I figured it couldn't really be that dramatic. You know, it's going to help a little bit. But here is a picture. These are tomato plants. And here's six tomato plants. And they have been infected with a fungus. This fungus is called Ralstonia. And you can see, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of lame. Like, you, wouldn't, you don't think that the, they would probably never make tomatoes. And that's their entire purpose. Um, and at least two of them have died. But if you take these plants and in, into the water you add my bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, what you see is that they... <laughs> that was the best reaction. <laughs> um, yeah, is that you see that they grow really big. So you can imagine, you know, I think food waste is a really big thing to worry about. And crop rotation. Um, some of our fungicides are working. Maybe there's a solution that's already existing in the soil. And this is a pretty big difference. So, yeah. Are there any known, like, negative side effects to adding bacteria? Yeah, so are there any known negative side effects? Um, um, are there any known negative side effects? Not really. Um, yes and no. So not to the plants. If you add the good bacteria, <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a negative. Um, but it could depend on the context. And then the other really important thing is that one of the things scientists are asking, is it really a good idea to have one major bacteria in the soil, right? Like we were saying, if you what if something happens, right? Or antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance. So one thing that is kind of interesting is that almost all of the bacteria in the soil have some sort of antibiotic resistance, but we don't want them to all share each other's, right? And become these things that we can't do anything about. So that's a problem. Um, and it also kind of sounds kind of scary, right? But um, does, anyone know, does anyone know what GMO stands for? It's like a course. Uh, yeah, genetically modified organisms. 
So, what do you think? If I, if I change my bacteria, if I go in there and add a new protein, is that a GMO? Yes, and the FDA, the federal government, agrees with that. If I take my bacteria and I add a protein, and I put it, I take this genetically modified organism and I put it onto a plant, is that plant a GMO? No. Is that plant organic? It is. So this is the current workaround that a lot of people are trying to, to do, right? Where this, if we can add bacteria, even if we do things with them, we can still call it organic. We can still say it's not a GMO. Yeah. Is there a question? No. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Oh, you're fine. So you, um, I'm guessing you're familiar with the higher rank spot virus. I don't know how it works. I know what it is. Basically, it was just it was almost wiped out the line of papaya, and they used genetic modification to uh, make it. Do you think this, like, let's say this technology had been around at the time of the Hawaiian Rings spot crisis, do you think it could have been used to solve that problem? Maybe. You know, microbes interacting with viruses are tricky, but one thing that could be done, um, so I, I mentioned that plants have immune systems, um, and one of the things is that if you make a plant a little bit sick, it'll actually get stronger against other pathogens. So a pathogen is a microbe that is going to make something sick. If you add a little bit, uh, and it's enough that the plant can kind of clear that infection, then it's more likely to resist other infections. So it might be possible we could use a beneficial bacteria. Um, but definitely now, uh, there's some fungus that gets into cassava. Does anyone know what cassava is? It's a starchy root. It's sort of, it's like, you know, Potato is actually a chew, but it has that same texture. Um, yeah. yeah. For anyone who's familiar with boba and boba tea, you made cassava. Yes. Tapi so. boba. <laughs> I love boba. Who else likes boba tea? This is not that good, but I just want to. All right. <laughs> yeah. So right now, people are trying to find a good bacteria to help them. Yes. Is it kind of like the flu? Like if you use the flu, what? You know, you can't get the same flu again. Kind of. It's the same. Yeah, so it's not kind of, it's not as specific. So the thing is that plants have what is called an innate immune system, and we do as well. And so our innate immune system looks for the things that we know aren't us. So you don't have cells that have a certain type of outer membrane protein and sugar. Like there's certain things that your body just doesn't make, but bacteria do. And so your innate immune system is so old, like throughout all of history, and we all come into this world with the same innate immune system that we'll have. So that one is fixed. Your body knows, hey, that's not me. But our adaptive immune system will get something and realize, wow, that thing and I was really sick happened at the same time. So that is bad. And if we ever see that again, we're immediately going to get it out of our system. So that is true with that, that situation. Plants only have the innate immune response. So they're not going to be as specific, but what they will do is they'll say, I was sick in this leaf, I'm good in this leaf, so we need to turn up our immune system all over and try to save at least half of ourselves that we make that sugar. Yeah, yeah. This might be a silly question, but can plants get autoimmune Yes, plants can totally get autoimmune disorders, um, and actually we get them to the plants all the time for science. Uh, so. <laughs> It's for science. For science. Um, that's part of the reason I do plant research is I really didn't want to kill a bunch of mice. Uh, that's what my cousin does. So. Yeah, totally valid. <laughs> like, it's a very necessary part of science right now, but I just didn't want to do it. Um, so yes, a lot of the times what we'll do is we know which genes are important in plants, and we can go in and knock out those genes and make the plants much more susceptible or likely to get the disease. <coughs> I think we're getting close to running out of time. Um, but let me. Um, so, yeah. So the right bacteria have to get to the plant, right? Um, so, first of all, they have to get there. So, we talked about that. They have to swim there. What do you think they have to do next? Someone mentioned why, this, why the good bacteria might not win 
otherwise, or why it not, might not matter. Yeah? You have to like, get room on the grid and latch on to make it frame. Exactly. They have to get there, latch on. They form, they, they all get there, they all make a group. And once they're in the group, they can actually start making the sticky material, maybe getting other bacteria that will live with them and start producing those chemicals that we've talked about really being really important. So um, we can have some hypotheses, um, but I'd rather actually talk about like what are we going to study next? More microbes. More microbes. I love that. What kind of microbes? Like what do you want to do? These are all open questions because the answer to this is that you decide. Um, because I have hopefully a year and a half left in my PhD, um, and in ten years y'all will be where I am. And so the questions that you start coming up with, that's what's going to be answered. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've seen any difference in um, the interaction, or I guess what you call this transmission process when the bacteria are coming in to meet the root. Have you seen a difference in that in like wetland plants or plants that don't grow in soil necessarily? Yeah, so are these interactions, let me make sure I have this, uh, are these interactions um, and, and how the bacteria are actually kind of colonizing the plant and being sustained on the plant, does this differ based on are they in wetlands, or is it a hydroponic system, is it in soil, is it in the desert? Uh, and yes, absolutely. So soil is super complex. And the uh, thing is is that we study it in very the most simple ways we can. So in my system, it's a hydroponic system. But I'm using plants that like to live on land. Um, but that's kind of how we study it right now because we don't have a better system for it. Um, but we do think we do think it matters. We think that every little difference in the environment is going to make a change. So that would be a good direction to go, right? Like how do each of these environments affect it? How are all the chemicals in the environment or the temperature? Yeah. What else? What do you think would be interesting? You can ask any question. Uh, slime molds, yeah, most of my experiments, bacteria can smell great or they can smell terrible. I'm trying to think of a question that I had that was just ridiculous. Because um, you have them. I think one of the questions I had was like, oh, I had one recently and I was super wrong, so that was cool. I had a question of, okay, some of my bacteria stuck on the plants. Maybe something happened with them because I, I kept these plants in water for way too long on purpose to see would this bacteria stick forever. And most of them fell off, but there were like 20 left on the plants. And so I thought, oh, maybe something really cool just happened and they had a mutation and now they can do different things and this is the answer. This is the bacteria that we put in the soil and it's going to exist and be amazing. And so I did this experiment where I took those bacteria and immediately put them onto a new plant. And it didn't have any effect. <laughs> it was just like the regular bacteria. And so that's that's really great because you can look at that and say, well, that's a silly question. You know, nothing, of course nothing's happening with them. But it totally could have happened. Um, and now I know that wasn't what was happening. And so it has to be other things. Those 10 or 20 bacteria are probably hiding in one of those little root hair corners. And so I want to understand that instead. Yeah? Could you apply something like this? Like, since microbes are pretty good survivability, right? Like, so say you're like, you know, like colonization of other planets where the ecosystem might be not be as ideal for plants to use microbes to make that easier or something. Yeah, so yeah, the question was um, can we use microbes to help the transition to maybe being on or using other planets? Um, so the term is usually called like terraforming, I believe. Yeah. It's not so good. So terraforming, like changing it into usable land. And um, yeah, so they want microbiologists, and microbiologists are already doing this work of trying to figure out, could we take a community of microbes and put it on something like Mars and make it turn into something useful? Because right now, that's the biggest problem is not only is the atmosphere bad, but if we put a plant outside of Mars, let's say it was warm enough, let's say it had enough sun, let's say the soil was good, you bring up, if you brought a potted plant to Mars, it wouldn't do very well. Um, but let's say you brought it in and you did something like um, that movie where... Margin. Margin, thank you. Um, 
I sometimes watch babies. But, <laughs> so, like Marcia, where he grows all these plants and he needs to get water and things like that. Um, well, let's say you had that big greenhouse, but you didn't bring any soil. If you went out and got the soil from Mars, you probably wouldn't have enough nutrients. And you probably wouldn't have, you wouldn't have any bacteria. And so that's something that microbiologists are trying to figure out is, if we were going to do some terraforming, which bacteria could we bring? Do we need to bring every single bacteria in the world? Could we just use some soil? Or is it, because we don't understand how that balances. Yeah? Yeah, so as far as we as far as we know, we haven't identified any life outside of Earth or originating from Earth. It can end up outside of Earth because it ends up on things. Um, but what we do know is that it seems like some of the soil might be able to support life. One of the big questions that is really contentious or people are, are debating it is will we even recognize life on a different planet, right? Like we didn't know that viruses existed. 120 years ago, maybe even less. Um, we can debate if viruses are alive. That's one debate. But um, <laughs> we didn't know they existed. We just thought people were getting sick for no reason. Um, and so we didn't recognize viruses. And now, of course, there's viruses. And so there could be things that we don't even recognize as living on these other planets. Yeah? Isn't that kind of like how, like, like pretty much a lot of scientists are like, oh, first thing you need on a planet to sustain life? Exactly. Like the first question was, right, or one of the earliest questions was, do we have bacteria in the center of the earth? I'm like, nope. Maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. No, man, maybe. Yeah. Um, how are you handling your control over your users? Like, what is your control? Like? Yeah, so what is my control? Does anyone have a basic definition of control for me? Yeah. Um, a specimen or something you don't put the experiment on. So exactly. You are like trying some experiment you were adding something to be controlled when you don't have it. I just wondered since you're working with um, like things that are alive, I guess. Yeah. No, exactly. So there's a bunch of different options for controls. Um, I showed you one a little bit earlier where I had the plants that just had the fungus and the plants that didn't. In the original whole figure, there would be the plants without the fungus, the plant or yeah, the plants without the fungus, the plants with just the fungus, the plants with just the bacteria, and then the combination. Um, but another thing I do sometimes is that I know my bacteria can help the plants, uh, but I sometimes add on a bacteria that I know can't help the plants. Or with my bacteria, again, I'm able to change its genes. I can actually take a bacteria that I've made so it doesn't stick to the plant. We talked about it getting there and actually sticking. I can use a bacteria that doesn't stick, and I can show that, hey, even when they're together, I still don't see those bacteria on the plant. Yeah? I should have asked this question when we were talking about it, but yeah, how do you plan? <laughs> no, this is a great thing. So, um, okay. Has anyone planted a vine before? Yeah. Um, do you count if I, does it count if I eat grapes and I just put the seeds and the seeds drop? I like it, yeah. Do you remember how you planted it? Yeah. Yeah, and you take a cut it, right? So the same way we grow vines is we cut off most of them. Um, we cut off a little piece and we grow it. And, and what's cool about vines is that they will make little roots and then eventually it will be a whole new vine. Um, bananas are similar. You can take a cutting. Uh, you can't just like stick a banana in the ground, but please try some pictures. Um, but your parents will send me an email being like, what did you do? Um, no, so that's how we do it. So every single banana that you eat like the ones that we eat in the grocery store come from that. Uh, yeah. Huh? They're all, yeah, they all have the same genetics. And the worst part is that we can't even go in and change their genetics because you have to have an embryo to change genetics. Otherwise, it's really complicated. Yes. Does anyone, oh, this is fun. Now we're getting stuff that I barely know. Um, does, anyone, <laughs> does anyone know the really cool advancement? Where you can change, of course you know. <laughs> I'm gonna pick a guy next to you called CRISPR. Yep, CRISPR. Cas9 enzymes. Cas9, CRISPR Cas9, exactly. Huh? 
What does that tell us? It's probably just a trigger, right? Yeah. It's pretty slow, right? Yeah. Inside of the plant, where they get more food when they start devouring the plant because they have a chance to. I don't 